Okay, I'm going to talk today about poverty and the nutrition and disease. This, if you like, this unholy and healthy trinity. And of course, this is a very famous slide of last year, which shows you the interactions between these three. You can see that there are background causes to, at the very top here, the undernutrition. And then you go through underlying causes, and then of course you then go up to the immediate causes above that. And the important things I want you to focus on initially are that the undernutrition is a dual function, if you like, caused by the combination of what I would call undernutrition, inadequate dietary intake, and also disease. And what quite often happens is that people do not focus on those two elements, they only focus on nutrition. As you will hear from my talk, I think focusing on only nutrition is not going to solve the, the, long, the problems in the long term. Maybe short term they will, but definitely not long term. And of course, underlying that, we of course have poverty. So, undernutrition is caused by two major factors. First of all, the quality and also the, the quantity of food that you take in. It's not just the case, therefore, of taking a sufficient carbohydrate. That will give you the, the quantity. It's the quality. You therefore need some type of protein. You need essential vitamins. You need micronutrients. <laughs> so, it's a balanced diet that you require. Now, on the other side of the coin, you've therefore got infection. Now, infections can operate, as you'll see shortly, in two ways, either directly on the individual impacting upon their nutritional status or indirectly. But there's a further factor. These two again interact. So if you are undernourished, your immune function is suppressed and therefore you are more likely to get disease. Okay? Likewise, disease leads to increasing amounts of undernutrition too. So these are not separate at all. They are very closely, intimately linked together. Of course, the underlying causes are poverty, of course, and then various practices and the usual things like sanitation and health services as well. We can measure the burden disease by this thing called the DALI, Disability Adjusted Life Years. If you look across here, you'll see that the major one of all is underweight. If you keep on going across and add them up, you'll find that six of the top 13 factors are associated with undernutrition and poverty. I think you need to appreciate how, from my perspective, I measure nutrition which may be not the same as you perceive it. So I'm just trying to, as it were, lay, lay down the ground rules of how I perceive we go about measuring it. There are, in essence, three ways in which we can measure nutrition, either by using anthropometry, measuring people's height or weight or some type of body composition, some type of more or less invasion by taking a blood sample, perhaps, getting some type of biochemical indicator, or through a clinical examination. Because of time, expense, etc., and lack of invasion, the usual method is anthropometry. We therefore measure usually people's height and weight, and from that we can then develop various indices. And basically what we do is we measure their height and weight, and we then compare them for their age and their sex to some international norms, which I'll specify in a second. From that we can then get three measures, weight for height, a measure of wasting, height for age, a measure of stunting, and then weight for age, a measure of underweight. And these are measuring two different types of nutrition. Wasting is short-term, immediate undernutrition. Stunting is long-term, chronic. And underweight is a mixture of the two. What we then get is a so-called Z-score. Those of you who are keen on statistics will know this is a normal deviate. So a child who's there for the average position will have a Z-score of zero, that position there. As then their height gets better or worse, so the Z-score becomes more positive or more negative, you therefore get a worsening height or better height, we take as our cutoff point for stunting this Z value here of minus two. So all the children in this area here will therefore be showing some degree of stunting. In the normal population, that will be about one in 40 people. And going to severe stunting, that's about one in 500. So that's a normal population. Now switch to the place that John was just mentioned a few seconds ago, the chores. And there, we've just done some surveys, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail later on. The average value then is no longer zero, it's minus two. So therefore, in this population of children, half the population, therefore, are stunted, as compared to one in 40 in the normal population. And a staggering one in six is showing severe stunting compared to one in 500 in the normal population. And of course, only a mere minority are above the zero position. 
Up until 2006, all those z-scores we used were all based upon the 1978 American databases, the FELS Longitudinal Survey and the N. Haynes. And these were there for references. And then in April 2006, WHO released then growth standards. Now standards and references to us are entirely different beasts. Okay? Standards are things that we should be attaining. So nowadays we therefore have standards. Okay? And they've got this information from dealing with well-nourished children from those countries. So the Ghanaian sample was very large because of course lots of them suffer from various diseases. So all children now between below the age of five now can have their height for age, weight for age, and weight for height measured by standards. All those older than that have to use currently the old references. So we have to switch therefore between references and standards in terms of which age group we're looking at. So that's the statement from WHO, which I won't bother to read out. You can read it for yourselves. Adults. We measure then their height and weight, from which we compute their body mass index, or BMI, which is basically weight over height squared. This then forms a linear relationship, or close to that. We have various cutoff points as agreed by FAO and WHO. So those less than 18.5 are showing some degree of chronic energy deficiency. The normal range, 18.5 to just under 25, and then two levels of pre-obese and obese. These upper two gradations here work primarily for Americans and Europeans. They do not, though, work or efficient for Asians. And a meeting we had in Singapore a few years ago suggested we might have lower cutoff points for the pre-obese and obese because they have higher fat levels for a given body mass index. And depending whether or not you wish to follow metrics here or imperial scales, you can then work out from here what your body mass index is if you so wish. But, between kids or adults, anthropometry does not provide you with the complete picture of somebody's nutritional status. So if I knew somebody's height or weight, I would not know whether or not, for example, that child was anemic or not. I would not know if they lack essential micronutrients. So there are very clear limits in terms of what anthropometry can or cannot tell you or me. And for that, we'd have to do some type of biochem anal analysis to actually get the answer that we require, which I'll show you in one second. And in adults, again, that again has to be taken with some care, because if you look at some of these second row fours we play for England, they'll have a body mass index of about 32. They've virtually got no fat on them at all. They're just solid muscle. Okay? So again... This does not correct for fat mass versus muscle mass. So some care needs to be used in terms of using this body mass index. You can, of course, go further than that. You can look at waist-to-hip ratios if you want to get more specific information. Just to show you that we can, in fact, measure anemic status very easily, this is taken uh, three months ago in one of the Dhaka slums. This slum has an amazing statistic, which I keep on quoting. There are this Dhaka slum... Is, covers five square miles and there are 2.5 million people living on that slum all on single story accommodation so that's quite heavy density of population so the down below here you see the hemo queue which has been opened up so it's been opened up here and here's where you read off it here and we use these so called spring loaded lancets and they basically press it onto the skin the child usually doesn't feel very much at all you then put the bud into a so-called micro-cuvette here, clean it off, and then place it back into that bottom part here and close it up, and within 30 seconds then, you have that hemoglobin value. So it's very quick, very easy, and very accurate indeed. And it just runs on four AA batteries. and costs around about £400, and the Chores Livelihood Programme are just ordering five for their new nutrition programmes, and the Shiri Project has already got two, which we're utilising already. <coughs> 